So everyone, um, this is we today we have the pleasure of um, Bernard Arcourt and uh, Mia Reuter visiting us and Bernard is doing an amazing, incredible Zoom uh, series um, called Abolition Democracy that I can really, really, really recommend. It's amazing, like with the most amazing people, etc. cetera. So um, yeah, but we'll get there. Like I said, this, is, this was planned as a very uh, low, low key reading group. So it has a different vibe to it. Um, but yes, I'm very happy that you that you can all join. Maybe we should, I mean, I think there will be more people because I've received several emails from people that wanted to join. So I guess we can wait two more minutes and then we can start. Is that okay? It's fine, it's fine, no problem. Okay. Oh, I put the blog for the next, uh, for the next, uh, the information for the next uh, abolition in the chat. Yes, thank you. Perfect. And what I will do, Katarina, and, and uh, I, I've decided to change a little bit the, <laughs> the presentation. I will, I will, because with the book of um, Agnes Nascimento, at least the, the, the part that we read, just the introduction, and after it was on page 63, uh, so we had like a dark side of, of what's going on in Brazil. Yeah. And, uh, and so I will briefly mention the book and after we can go in the discussion, but I would like to show the, the brighter side of, 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 of Brazil um, uh, and more uh, in relation to the resistances, political resistance in, that are going on in Brazil. Uh, because I was thinking maybe for non-Brazilian scholars or for people who, 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 who have not studied Brazil or not live in Brazil, uh, uh, reading this book, uh, Bolsonaro, means that it's over. I mean, what am I going to do? So I, I, I thought that it would, it would be nice also to talk about the different strategic forms of resistance that historically uh, have, been, have, have been taking place in Brazil and and today. Uh, so uh, I will talk about this to have a bright I mean, light and to see this also yes. against, against racism, against white supremacists, etc. To give us some hope for the beginning of the new year. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so I guess we should start and um, I will uh, just make a very short introduction to Antonio Pelli and then you can take over. Um, welcome to our first session this year. This is the fifth session of our reading group on decolonization, new colonialism and human rights. And for those uh, of you who are new to our format, we're meeting every second week. The meetings usually take an hour and a half and there's always a short presentation and then the floor is open for discussion. So please feel free to participate. And like I said, this project has started off as a very low key down to earth reading group among PhDs, postdocs, professors and peers. But however, thanks to the digital format, we have been able to invite scholars from all over the world and the reading group has transformed into a series of master classes or guest lectures. So today I have the pleasure and privilege of introducing Professor Antonio Pelli to you who will be speaking about Abjes do Nascimento and his text, Brazil Mixture or Massacre, published in uh, 1979. Antonio Pelli is an associate professor at the law school of the Pontificia Universidade Católica do Rio de Janeiro and has a permanent appointment at the Lucian Blaga University of Sibiu, Romania. From 2003 to 2013, Antonio had a position at the Carlos III Universidad de Madrid and in um, 2010, he was a visiting scholar at the University of Chicago, Posen Family Center for Human Rights. Antonio's academic research explores critical theory, human dignity, and political resistances with a special focus on Brazil. He's the author of three monographs and editor of five collective volumes, the most recent being Direitos Humanos e Neoliberalismo, published in 2018, Direitos Humanos Entre Captura e Emancipação, which was just published last year, 
Em maio de 1968, representações e reivindicações, which will be published this year. Antonio also functions as co-editor of the journal, uh, journal Direito, Estado e Sociedade and the Brazil edition of Sens Public. He's active in several NGOs, he has a podcast, and he regularly publishes his insights in the press. So Antonio, thank you so much for being here and sharing a Brazilian perspective on decoloniality and human rights with us today. And like you said, giving us some hope for the new year um, about different movements of resistance in Brazil. And we're very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Katarina. Uh, and happy 2021 for, for everybody. It's a pleasure to be here again. Um, I will share a PowerPoint here. We see the PowerPoint, do we? Okay. So um, I will try to talk 15, 15, 20 minutes on, 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 on the subject. So we have time for, for a conversation because uh, this reading group is about conversation. I really like what Walter Miolo said the last time, you know, uh, how we can have here just a conversation. It's not a talk, it's not something purely academic, even if I would do a PowerPoint, but it's just to give you some, some, some brightness. No? So we have the book of, uh, we read a little bit some parts of the book. This is, this is, a part, this is a, the original version of Portuguese of Adias de Nascimento. Uh, he explained how we have a particular form of racism in Brazil. Uh, it's a racism through denial uh, and how the myth of racial democracy is an ideology and act as if, he doesn't use a term, but as a kind of false, false consciousness in Brazil, which maintain, which uh, justify the discrimination of, of non-white population and uh, the power of white supremacy. It's a very dark, a very dark uh, description. But if you read the, the, the I think the, 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 the first text in the book, it's the, the, it's the text of the 1989 publication. It's more, uh, Abdias is more uh, optimist, optimistic. He said, things have changed. Things have changed in Brazil. People do resist. And uh, he gives some, some, some example uh, in terms of a new constitution in 1888, in terms of uh, cultural resistance, uh, political resistance, collectives. So I will go within, with this, this invitation of Abdias Nascimento, trying to explain some kind of resistance in Brazil. Uh, how can we, uh, I send also my paper. I mean, my paper is very dark too, you know? I talk about tropical necropolitics. I mean, where I do explain, I mean, just the numbers are terrible. I mean, every year in Brazil, we have 60, 70,000 people who are murdered. 80,000 people who disappear, who are missing, half of them, 40,000 are children. And yes, we can talk about necropolitics in Brazil, absolute necropolitics, absolute counter-revolution as a kind, as a Bernard would, would say. But we have resistance. This radical form of violence, we have extraordinary, outstanding, uh, innovative, massive, capillary way of resistance of protest manifestation in Brazil now and in history and certainly in the future. So it, it is my take I want to, to show some example, show you some, some example. Uh, so yeah, because if we usually within the critical theory or some, some studies, uh, one thing is, uh, this is my take here on my thesis, one thing is the way the Brazilian state society intend to treat black, brown, indigenous people, racism, necropolitics. And the other thing is the way this community live actually. You know, they do not let themselves to be reduced to these conditions, do not let themselves to be reduced to using Franz Fanon, this zone of non-being. We don't have to mix those two, two things. They have, they are, there is deep, uh, profound, uh, uh, way of, of resistance. Um, excuse me, I'm, because, okay. So I'm talking about, with a neologism, Brazilians, Brazilians, 
resilience sees. Like resilience, like a mix of resistance and resilience. I I'm interested in, in the gray zone. You know, I'm not interested in the, the revolutionary radical changes. It can be interesting. It has been done. I'm more interested in the gray zone, in the gray zone with uh, everyday resistances. So, but I would start with something very common, the protest, the organizations, the network of recent resistances, and the end hidden and explored form of resistances, at least in the dominant Brazilian philosophical scholarship. So remember, protest and manifestation in Brazil. Uh, I will quote three examples of masses of people who protest in Brazil historically and until now. Uh, May 68, May 68, like in Latin America, was huge in Brazil against the dictatorship, uh, against the, the murder of students, of politicians. And we have the, even the, 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 the role of the part of the church was here along with the people to struggle against the, the dictatorship. I have organized a seminar two years ago about this, and uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was very, 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 uh, very interesting. We have the June 2013 protest. And you know, when I look at this picture, so remember it was, it, it's just recent, huh? the, the protest in, in Rio de Janeiro in Sao Paulo for the fees of the public transport. And in the middle, what do we have? The masses attacking the, the, the assembly. You know, it's like one week ago, this picture. It would be easy to, 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 uh, to think about the capital or from June 2013 to think little by little we go to Bolsonaro, uh, the, the coup against Dilma in 2016 and after Bolsonaro, etc. But uh, it's still we can discuss about this with this relation with, 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 uh, with what has happened in, 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 in the United States recently, how a part of the of the part of the of the crowd was from for the far right was already co-opted by by some conservative forces. So, but we still have some. I mean, the other the, 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 on the left, the other two pictures represent some progressive leftist leftist uh, 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 political claims. Uh, in 2016, because of, of, the, of the, some reform in the education, we had a huge, huge uh, Occupy movement in the high school, in school in Brazil also. Uh, with teenagers, uh, young people from 13 years old, 20 years old, were occupying uh, the schools in Brazil against the education reform. You know, we can see that Occupy is a, is, uh, is uh, occupies to resist uh, public public uh, public education is a right uh, and sino publico e diretto. We had more recently in 2018 what was called a feminist spring, a lot of uh, female collective uh, protesting against uh, rape, uh, some, some 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 rape situation, some. Uh, domestic violence take this, took the street and with huge manifestation also in 2016. So we have here the, the I would say the, the common, the ongoing, the masses, and which is uh, for foreigner and the Latino countries, but ongoing every day, not every day, but still protesting, masses protesting in Brazil and Latin America. Another, another, a second way of, of, of understanding resistance in Brazil it's, uh, I would say, I mean, uh, it's a typical contentious politics and organizations and collectives, you know. Uh, so we have the Quilombos, of course, uh, I, I, I will refer to, 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 to Adias Nascimento, who has also uh, written a book on, on, on Quilombos, uh, Quilombism. Um, so Quilombos were uh, the former land of, of slaves that, that escaped, you know, the, I think in, in English would be the Maroons. And, uh, and the constitution, the Brazilian constitution, uh, respect, should respect their, 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 their right, their right of ownership of the lands, but they are still struggling you know, with, with, with the state, with uh, 
cooperation with multinationals, with so this is an ongoing struggle with the quilombos. So it's the first uh, element, the quilombos. Of course, in Brazil, there is the resistance from the indigenous people, ongoing resistance from indigenous people, exactly for the problem of issues related to the land. I mean, a lot of the resistance in Brazil are related to land ownership you know, against latifundios, for instance. We'll see uh, an author at the end. Uh, one of the most important, uh, maybe the most important um, uh, association in Latin America with almost two million membership is the Landless Workers Movement that are asking for land reform, that are occupying uh, lands that are not productive, or even the land of multinational corporations that are not productive, they are occupying them and resist against and ask for a land reform in Brazil. Uh, from the landless worker movement, we had the homeless workers movement that occupy uh, empty buildings for homeless workers. And there, after that, they are under doing some strategic uh, mitigation uh, using in particular uh, not only but a term of the constitution on the social function of property. More recently another strategy of, of, of um, political resistance have been what I've translated are uh, mandatos colectivos or collective mandates where um, different politicians, a lot of are, are women, uh, different political figures, excuse me, a lot of are women. Um, uh, one, one city council, I would say, uh, how do you say, uh, one city council uh, 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 post, I will not forget, uh, one city council chair. Uh, uh, will be for one person, but it will be, it will represent two, three or four people. You know? So it allows you to have a more collective uh, representation of different issues and a lot are based on the labor reform, on informal work, work on um, uh, gender equality. And this is something that has happened very recently in the recent recent city elections. One person who's important or a bit famous is on the right, Maria dos Camelos, for instance. Uh, I, I pick up another, for instance, another example of, of those kind of, of this. Uh, innovative uh, collective mandate is called Quilombo Periférico. I found also on the Instagram with uh, Deborah Diaz, who's only 22 years old. He has been recently elected in, in Sao Paulo. And in their Instagram, they actually use a sentence of, of, of Adias Nascimento referring to Quilombo as something that entails something as a network that entails solidarity. Uh, freedom, fraternity. So we have seen protest, we have seen uh, political form of resistance, traditional. There is also, there are also other forms of resistance in Brazil against racism, against inequalities. If I call that, and we can call that capillary, capillary network of resistance. For instance, the, the network emancipation, Reg Emancipa, no? uh, you know, in Brazil, there is a still, like in many countries, in Brazil in particular, some difficulties, obstacles to access higher education. Uh, this network try to help uh, young people to access uh, universities. So it's a way also to fight inequalities, no? where education is at the center of of progress, and he can reframe, can remember maybe the pedagogy of the press of Paulo Freire. Another very important thing about this network of resistance in Brazil that is huge, very important, are in the <clears throat> in the favelas, 
uh, where 14, 15 million people, at least maybe more, uh, lived and worked in Brazil. And so the favela is not uh, a place where uh, you have people uh, having drug every day uh, with the dogs walking like this. No, people are working in the favela. Uh, people are living in the favela with all their dignity and it's very important it's very interesting to see how uh, mothers have organized themselves uh, in order to uh, to foster to to protect their their, 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 their their children through different kind of network schooling etc well, we will come back to that later uh, another network another kind of association is uh, typical association called Terrativa, who is also helping uh, children and young people through arts and education. I mean, there are many kind of uh, NGOs, uh, Brazilian NGOs who, who are working, association working in the, in the favelas. And maybe it will be a question uh, after that. It is true that in Brazil, there is a, a problem a problem, an issue with a question with uh, uh, evangelical churches, no? That a lot are, are conservative, um, but within uh, this religion, and there is there are also some progressive movements. So there is this movement called Black Evangelical Black Evangelical Movement, Movimento Negro Evangelico, with Jackson Augusto, who is also a journalist at the Intercept. Um, it's trying to, to bring some progressive touch in, into this, this religion, because sometimes there is a kind of cliche, like looking down to the evangelists, they are uh, conservative, they are ignorant, they propose scenario. I mean, it's too, too black and white here. There are also some progressive movement, movement within, within this religion. And the black evangelical movement is, is interesting for us to, to study too. Uh, like a pause here, I would like to introduce you briefly some maybe some Brazilian authors. Uh, I, I will send the, 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 the you will receive the PowerPoints to to later if you want, so you don't have to rush writing the the, the, the authors. So there are many uh, authors here: Silvio uh, Almeida, uh, Deborah Diniz, Jamila Ribeiro, Tula Pires, who's a colleague and friend, Swiss at Puki Rio, Sueli Camero, Elton Krenak. With the middle of an indigenous uh, activist and writer, uh, I mean that it's, there is an explosion, in particular since 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 the election of the of the current president. And many books. I mean, every day we have every day every month there is there are new books in Brazil about uh, anti-racism, about uh, black uh, feminism, about uh, indigenous resistance. Those are examples. There's this wonderful book in the middle about. Uh, um, on Maria de Franco. I mean, there are many books publishing, a very productive book, uh, publication on resistance, on the history of, 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 of Brazil. Uh, what I would like to, to conclude now is, uh, is uh, it's been my project with a colleague, a friend of colleague Britannia, I see, uh, about writing a book. We are thinking about a book, writing a book about resistance in Brazil from a philosophical point of view, which is uh, an aspect that has not been worked, studied a lot. And uh, wh what I am interested in is, in, is the gray zone, you know? is the gray zone. How, how can we resist in Brazil uh, with this necropolitics that, that Abdias Nascimento described or I've tried to describe my paper and others have described much better than me. Uh, uh, you know, where you keep, Half of the population live with um, 200 million, more or less. Half of the population live with uh, $100 per month. Uh, how can you resist? How can we talk about resistance here, political resistance here? No? Uh, I think there's just, I will give you three, three, three little things. Uh, I think there is one thing first is life itself, to be alive is a form of radical political resistance, to be alive. When, when you live in a country that is, want, that wants to kill you uh, with a bullet or for starving, the only fact to be alive 
is a radical form of political resistance. Uh, I quote in my paper, Sobrevivencia e Resistencia. Uh, survival is resistance. Uh, daily struggle is resistance. And we have an example here, and also a figure that has appeared during the pandemic, Paolo Lima, the leader of the anti-fascist delivery people, entregadores antifascista, fighting against, fighting for their, for, for their, for their, for their rights. Uh, he, he said, Quiero uh, una especie de entregadores panteras negras conscientes. I want a kind of delivery, delivery guys who are like Black, uh, black Panther, who has an, uh, the awareness of the Black Panther, no? And uh, here we can see on the, on the backpack here, Ariscando mi vida para matar a su fome y a mi no? He's, they, they're playing with words, so say, I'm, 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 I'm risking my life uh, in order to, to earn my, uh, in order to, 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 to eat and in order so I, can, I can eat and you can eat. I'm risking my life, no? I'm risking my life because of the, of the COVID, I'm risking my life because of the, of the, of the extreme pre precarity where they're living. So this is everyday survival, everyday survival in Brazil. Informal work in Brazil is huge. Uh, and it is a form of radical political survival. Now the whole fact of being alive to wake up every day to 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 go for a job to it is resistance, political resistance against a Brazilian necropolitics. The first first aspect. Second aspect uh, during the pandemic, and it's the uh, almost the last point during the pandemic. Uh, we saw in, in the favelas uh, a huge mutual aid network uh, taking place. So on the, the, the picture on the right, we show that some, some favelas have created their own uh, medical network, providing some health care. But not only that, uh, because they do know, I mean, the problem in Brazil is not like in the United States and Europe. I mean, they have already assumed that the state will not interfere they will then just the, the the choice is to survive or to die i mean it's already assumed we're not going to claim for more things i mean it's already done and the other thing is very interesting is that it's not only since the pandemic also before they have created some network to profit to provide not not only food to people but also to produce food in the favela uh, to produce even organic food in the favela. Uh, so we're talking about food security. So here too, we have a kind of pandemic resistance against the, 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 the wide necropolitic in Brazil. And finally, okay, so yeah, there is a nice, uh, if you're interested in this topic, there is a nice in National Geographic, you can see with this title, Sao Paulo favelas are running out of food. These women are stepping in, so you see people organizing here, uh, ambulances, uh, network, people preparing food for the favelas inhabitants. And a very nice uh, uh, reportage here in the, in the National Geographic. And finally, what I think, uh, art to art in Brazil is, not, is artistic, it's cultural, of course, but it's, it is also uh, a form of political resistance. When, when black people are framed as dangerous, as criminals, as or they are invisibilized, or when they when they appear, they appear as dead bodies. The very fact of having fun, dancing, of painting uh, is a is an act of resistance so what we can call i mean embodied resistance embodied resilience uh, and there is this example of the 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 passinho passinho is a dance that appeared in the late uh, in the late 2000s in, in, in rio de janeiro that mix some uh, brazilian dance and rap a funk a dance yeah. And then it, it embodied for me uh, a form of, of political resistance uh, where the black youth is not reduced to, to a necropolitical subject. To the contrary, they resist that. And 
I, I think I will, tr we will try to, to watch a little, just to give you a little uh, sense of, of this, we'll try to watch a little things about the Passigno. Uh, hopefully it will, I don't think that you watch, you can watch that now already. I will do something. We can't see it right now. If not, maybe I can open it on my screen. Okay, thank you. Um, one I second. will stop. I will stop sharing. So. Yes. Let me see if I can share this. But. Or, or I can share it if you want. Yeah. Do, do you want me to share it? Sure. Know? Okay. Yes, perfect. There's no sound right now. No? No. Here? Yes. Here? No? There's no sound? No. OK. Um, well, I can, I, can just, I can just put a little bit uh, through the end like this. Okay. There are some sounds here now. No. Okay. Should I try so, you? So, so I can comment. So, no, so the, the, it shows that they are training how to, how, how to, how to. I can I can share after in teasing the PowerPoint so you can you can watch it on your own after that. You know. Yes, I will definitely send the link to everyone, but I can also uh, try to share it from the internet right away. Should I try that for a second? Let's just try. Yeah. I think we have the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So one second. Um, I think yeah. Uh, I can put it here for, for people. When I can have... can you see it here? Yeah. Agora deixa eu falar, tem uma boa pergunta. Se você não viesse para cá, o que seria, né, gente? Não seria nada, Eu acho que. Todo, toda criança de periferia, de comunidade, sonha ou em ser jogador, ou em ser artista, músico. Só que aí, quando eu tive contato com a dança, eu tive certeza do, do que eu queria fazer. Baile, né? Gostava muito de funk e ficava louco para poder ver a, a rapaziada aqui da, da rua mais velha, o hino, né? E eu sempre quis ir. Eu já fiquei louco, filho. Da primeira música até a última, eu te dá um soco e eu fui andar pensando, acho que eu fui a pessoa mais feliz daquele baile ali. Sim, é 
já tipo mais por internet, mais em rede social. Cada dançarino gravava seu vídeo e, e postava na internet. Então ia pra Lan House, colocava lá Jackson, Michel, ou Oivinho e tal, passinho foda, via o passo deles, vinha pra casa, lembrava o que podia lembrar ali, ensaiava que ele ficava ali, pá, 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 aprendendo, aí depois ia, via, 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 assim, ia pra Lan House e vinha pra casa, ia pra Lan House e vinha, vinha pra casa. É o baile que é o verbo, vem pinando esse bum, vem pimente, 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 v
mixed with uh, social inequalities. Uh, so here it is interesting with Adias Nascimento, he, he really points on this kind of struggles that that it's still going on today, no? Uh, how can we uh, uh, produce radical change in Brazil? It is either by understanding the population through the classical Marxist class, social class struggle, or uh, with the light of anti-racism, or it is through uh, a deep radical racist uh, 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 excuse me, a deep radical war against uh, racism. No? The, he pointed out the, 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 those two elements and he said the problem is that the left has co-opted uh, the, 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 the black Brazilian activism movement. No? And there is still, uh, and I think they're right, there is still this kind of uh, protection, uh, awareness, awareness from black Brazilian activists from, from, from the left. Um, but there is also, there are also uh, uh, inter interconnections, uh, uh, common fights, no? At least what we saw with the collective mandates is, uh, is an example of, of this, no? So, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's that's what I, I have to say. It's just uh, a conversation once again. I'm not here to say that it's like this in Brazil or like that. But it's just some some of my insights, and happy to discuss whatever about the books also about about my presentation and yeah. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you Obrigado. so much for bringing together um, all these three different perspectives. Um, Nascimento and and his uh, 20th century impressions um, and then your text that was really taking all this input to today's struggles and problems I thought I thought it was very interesting and and then also today's presentation which of course um, I think we all needed to hear this because everybody's already so disappointed with how this year, year has started and especially in the US. Um, like you said, um, these images of the crowds that you show us um, obviously remind everyone of, of what happened last week at the Capitol. And I was actually asking myself this also while I was rereading your text, the text that you sent. Um, there's an interesting um, parallel but it's also quite the opposite from what um people you know what people misunderstand as an anarchist run to uh, the capital as like some sort of ungovernmentability like they say in the invisible committee text that you quoted um but it's going in the wrong direction in this case you know and i think i wanted to ask you where do you see the differences of one crowd like the crowd that is actually showing up in the streets, uh, trying to make themselves visible and, and, and asking for their rights that are usually denied, and a mob that is armed and somehow out of control also, but in a very different sense of, of what is going on. You know what I'm trying to say is, I don't know, for some, some, somehow we see this also now during the pandemic and also with all the movements that you've shown us, I think there's so much potential for amazing independent NGOs, movements, um, all these different um, 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 attempts to create a, a humane society, you know, something that would be actually talking to, like actually taking care of people who are involved and actually taking care of the local problems of, of a specific society, be it a favela or, um, you know, um, people, homeless people in New York who can't afford food anymore. And, and there's, I can see this here, um, that there's so many attempts of food distribution and the invisible hands and like all kinds of different things. Also in the protests, in the Black Lives Matter protests. So, so yes, I, um, I wanted to ask you how you see this is and, and how we can explain that, how we can <laughs> stick to a, like a productive idea of anarchism and not have white supremacist 
destroy this this idea and this motivation yeah uh so yeah at the end of of, of my paper i i, I do try uh, so for, for, you know that there, there is a there there, there is uh, I would just go into a little bit of Foucault, just but very briefly, not to, to, to understand the context. You know, in, in, in Foucault, the resistance is usually uh, reframed as uh, to not be governed like this or like that, more or less. No, ne pas être tellement gouverné. So at the end, you are still governed. No, so the 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 what, what what i was saying in the paper is that maybe there is an art of not being governed at all using uh, exactly the, this manifesto of the invisible committee and this art of not of not being uh, governed at all uh, we can see some examples in 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 brazil in the form of resistance historical forms of resistance in brazil to not be governed i mean it's more more interesting Heuristically, to think about how, how how not to be governed, than thinking, oh, uh, at the end I will be governed in a way or another way. So it, I think it's more radical, it's more interesting. It doesn't matter if it's like this in, in actual like this, but it's more interesting to think to have a broader, wider horizon. Um, maybe the difference in 2013, and I mean at least in 2013, uh, the, the, the 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 crowd was for the, I mean, for a better welfare state in Brazil, for the consolidation of it, was not for the destruction of the state. They may have attacked some, some institution, but it was not for the destruction of the states. Uh, even in Brasilia, they, they not go, went inside. It was much more some kind of demonstration. I don't think they had the intention to go inside. It was for the consolidation of the state, and there were some elements of uh, conservative elements that were starting here that co-opt those manifestations. That with with the with the, the kind of subtle kind of manipulation of the media in Brazil, they, at the beginning the media were against the, the, the manifestation. After the sudden they changed, they were in favor of the manifestation because they saw an opportunity, maybe, maybe. No, to to change the government, no, the uh, worker party, and uh, so maybe. Uh, so I, I would say that the, the difference is that at least at the beginning, uh, it's in favor of a better society, of wealth, of of a better welfare state, of uh, anarchism. If we talk about anarchism, and I quote mutual aid. It's also a quote from from direct quote from uh, kind of uh, solidarity networks based on anarchism. And, uh, you just have to look at the Verso publication a lot on, on mutual aid, mutual aid those days. So this idea of equals, uh, and I don't think it is the representation that we saw uh, uh, recently in the, the, the United States where. Uh, it was, it seems to be something uh, that doesn't have any idea about uh, mutual aids. But at the same time, um, well, I, I, after we can see the, I, I, after, after we, can, we can talk about the parallel, but uh, I don't think that concerning the capital, I don't think that uh, we might be prepared for worse thing in the United States. It's not because we're going to put some people in jail that that it's going to disappear. Uh, I, I think it's a starting point, just like maybe the, 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 the image of June 2013 Brazil was a starting point for something else. Maybe it's a starting point for something else. And we have to be ready in the United States, at least North Americans have to, to maybe to see some how people, people in Latin America have struggled and fight against uh, this this kind of uh, uh, soft dictatorship in their countries, you know. I think it would be North American have a lot to learn here. You're but right. It's not, yeah. it's, it's not really the case. I mean, it's not that we don't. It's very difficult to think about the future, but still, there is a parallel, maybe. 
You're right. Thank you so much for, for pointing this out. I think you're completely right. We should uh, like stop the discussion about the United States right now and focus on Brazil also because there's so many Brazilians in this group. So please um, feel free to enter in the discussion, everyone. And, and yes, share your insights about the reading or questions about the presentation, et cetera, whatever comes to your mind. We can barely hear you. Is there anything you can do about the microphone? Yes, perfect. Yay, I'm, I'm so sorry, I forgot about that. Um, the Zoom is very... Thank you for this presentation. The Faustinho video warmed my heart and um, all the forms of resistance because it's easy to lose track of those and they're ongoing. Um, but I, I wanted to talk, I know, uh, Katarina just said to refocus uh, to Brazil, but I, I, when you were showing in your presentation the protests of two, uh, 2013, that's exactly what I wanted to ask about because uh, I don't think we have a common sense of what that was and what that meant. I think after you, you I completely agree with uh, your recall, like, uh, your recap of the events, it was for transportation, it was like actual social movements, but then the content got uh, voided and it became this apolitical thing because of the media, but also because people started wearing the, the football jerseys. And then at one point it just automatically became, became this anti-establishment thing that is not arnicus per se, but it's very in line with far left, but far right, right? And then uh, I know the images that we saw last week, a lot of analysts were saying, oh, Brazil needs to think about this for 2022 when we're gonna have presidential elections, thinking about the transition of power. But for me, seeing those images, it reminded me so much of 2013, because I think there was a desacralization of the public space and what of the state could be and then this almost idea that it doesn't really matter who comes. So it's fine to have a Bolsonaro in there, somebody who says, I can't do anything for the country, the country is broken. So I don't know, um, I wanted to hear a little bit more about 2013 and what it meant. I think we, yeah, we're still living the consequences of that, but yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe someone else I can I can talk about a little bit my impression. Maybe someone else would like to ask, not maybe not to ask another question, but just to to add an observation, a comment on twenty thirteen or something else about the zero or about the text. Okay, so <laughs> maybe shy. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, uh, well, I don't know. I don't know about the we're still living in 2013, but this idea of the desacralization of the public space, I think you have a nice idea here, Talita, uh, where, and maybe it was a little bit the same with, uh, with the current president in, in, in the United States, uh, where it was something against the, the the, 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 the establishment and you have to occupy uh, the establishment to show that it is possible, it is true. Uh, at, at the same time, uh, the problem is that if we go, I mean, if we go into this, it will mean we have to be very careful so that the left is usually very sensible in, in how it 
mobilize itself, very self-centered, say, are we going to do something great, great, so it's very, very self, self-critic, you know? So I think at the same time, we have to be very careful to whom we, 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 we say this. Uh, if we say that to a, a person in a, who is engaged politically, uh, I don't know, he, he, this person would have to reframe his political strategy, but if we refer to these two, uh, I mean, the who, who were in, the, in this manifestation in Brazil, um, usually it was uh, the middle class, upper middle class, uh, people who can manifest. <laughs> But the majority of the Brazilian who live in the favela were maybe not able to manifest because maybe they get shot, so they can manifest. So within, even in the progressive uh, movement, we have maybe a racist a class uh, a division. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, uh, and it is a challenge. And this is a challenge with with, with the current with the current. Um, mobilization in Brazil, but we see some intersection. I mean, at least the collective mandate, uh, the current organization of the so-called PESOL, if we like it or not, try to embrace the different uh, uh, political uh, tendencies in Brazil, or, and at least the, 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 the anti-racist uh, politics. I've been a bit far away, Talita, but but uh, Hi. that's not so. No, no, that that's a great point. Um, thank you. Hi, Rita, a friend and colleague here. Rita is here from Portugal. Hello. Welcome to the discussion we were just talking about, um, in 2013. So, who was in Brazil in 2013? Uh, sorry? Who, who of everyone was in Brazil in 2015? Yuri? I, I think I definitely fit the bill of the white middle class Brazilian that went to the streets and had this realization, not really, but we knew, but like, oh, that's how people are treated. And then we, then later realized, oh no, this is rubber bullets, not real bullets. So I think that it was also a moment of kind of reckoning with some level of leftist privilege. And yeah, I think it's, it was very interesting to hear the debate. I think related. Oh, go ahead. What, who's talking? Oh, okay. <laughs> I have a, a related question, something I was thinking about, and actually, everything Antonio was just saying kind of set up perfectly what I've been thinking about. Um, one second, one second. I, I'm, I'm not sure if everybody's hearing this, but there's like an extra sound. I think maybe, um, can everyone turn their microphones off when they're not talking? My apartment is maybe haunted. Um, <laughs> no, I was attending a different uh, Zoom event a few weeks ago. Um, this group of women who published different texts um, I think it's being published in a collection called something like Feminist International, something like this. And people were talking about um, protesting. And so everything we were just saying about the issue of class uh, didn't come up. Um, but what I was thinking about, uh, they were discussing you know, kind of the image we have of protest is going to the streets and it creates something that is kind of a spectacular event and, you know, saturates uh, media with images of masses and crowds and, you know, bodies in the street. But as we know, uh, this isn't necessarily accessible for all bodies. Um, so maybe people with disabilities or people who are incarcerated uh, so I'm thinking not only of class, but in terms of, of these types of obstacles, if you could talk more about, uh, you say you're interested in some of these gray areas and different things that people are doing as a form of protest. And of course you gave, you know, the example of, of dance, but I'm wondering 
if there are any other forms that you're curious about or are working on that would be representative of you know a type of engagement um, that maybe transcends some of these different limitations or obstacles yeah thank you thank you Carl. um when uh, two things and i will answer your question i promise uh, when you mentioned this idea of bodies in the street in the streets you no know, of masses in the streets it reminds me a book no, I forgot the other, but she she wrote a book on uh, the the afterlives of May sixty eight. I think it's in English. I forgot her name, but it's, uh, I mean one of the best best book on May sixty eight in France. And the author she explained how it was difficult uh, in the sixties seventies uh, from for the historians for the social science scientists, uh, social science scientists after the Second World War to understand masses of living people fighting in the streets because we have seen previously masses of dead people, now it was something else. So it just remind me of what you were saying, I just have this book going to my mind, the after, the after, the afterlife, May sixty eight, and its afterlives, and it's very interesting to understand this, how we can have a commune of people taking the streets, and how this br bring a kind of radical change. But yes, Christine Ross, uh, Yuri, thank you, yeah, thank you, wonderful book, and um, uh, and how these masses of people is, is, is very interesting. And so it was the first thing. The second thing, I think it's very interesting to also to focus on the masses and populations or in communes, in communities, in collectives, to shy away from the, uh, the personalization of politics. Now we're going to find some leaders. I mean, it's important, maybe it's important today is to find some leaders, but sometimes it's very interesting to focus to to find some, to see the movements, the collectives it can be interesting too. So your question, okay. um, is, is there any any other kind of gray zone you know, in, 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 uh, in this daily form of resistance in Brazil now? Uh, it means that life itself has become politics, no? And it's beyond the, the concept of biopolitics in Foucault, huh? we're not, I'm not even here there. I mean, in my paper, I just said that biopolitics has maybe never exists in Brazil, just pure necropolitics. I mean, it's just not the popul population. It's not even, we don't care about population. So this daily resistance, this daily resistance, um, the things that come to my mind uh, would be, so uh, would be how some, how many uh, academic, uh, scholars are both professors, academics, and also political activists in Brazil, and how they try, which is what it would basically, how they try now to understand this, this dual role. Um, I have mentioned a little book here uh, of, uh, called Espaço Coruja, uh, about the legacy of Maria Franco, uh, you will have the the, 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 the PowerPoint, so you can get that. So it's two colleagues, Pamela Passos and Amanda Mendonça, who were uh, advisor of Maria Franco, but they were also professors and they are also mothers. And they describe how, I mean, it's wonderful, I mean, they describe how the first law, the first bill of Maria Franco in the city council, was a law um, to a law uh, late night shift kindergarten so that the mothers could uh, go to to study at night or engage politically but what do you do with the children usually they don't have any husband so you have a late night shift kindergarten and they explain all this process but they also ex try to explain this du dual role between uh, academic uh, professor and 
political activist. Maybe it can be a gray zone of resistance. Another gray zone of resistance that I'm particularly, uh, I find very, very uh, artistically very challenging in Brazil, uh, at least uh, it's the, the graffitis, the graffitis in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I don't want to make the promotion, but if you want to some, some ideas of graffitis, what we have many in Instagram, but in my site, uh, there's, I think I put something photos in my website, but just go there, you don't have to read anything else. There's some photos of the graffitis of Rio de Janeiro. And they're very, very engaged. I mean, they're amazing. Uh, you have those kind of graffitis in all the streets of Washington Botanico, who are referring to class struggles or fight, uh, fighting for the Amazonia or uh, fighting against political extremism. Or sometimes, I mean, this gray zone, uh, even though something uh, it's, it's very hard to see. Uh, you have like a bullet, just uh, uh, it's like a poster, like the one uh, on the back of Katarina. You have a poster in the street and a bullet, like just the, 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 the front of a bullet. And you have a name, Joana, uh, 2000-2007. So you say, you know, okay, a lost bullet, a child has been shot. The name was Joanna. You have this sometimes in Rio de Janeiro. It's also um, interesting. And maybe a form of artistic resistance. Um, uh, uh, you, you have a lot of funk. So the funk in Brazil is not like the funk in, it's, it, it used the funk, the, the, the North American funk scene, but it's mixed with rap and other elements. So you have the funk and the rap music. And there is actually a, a documentary in Netflix about, about someone called Emicida, uh, who there is a Netflix about this idea of the rap music, how it can be in Brazil something that empower uh, the, the black the black youth. Um, I think we have this. There is another thing I know that I'm not calling it because I don't know why. That, that in in Nones, in Nones, there is another documentary very nice about ballet in in Rio de Janeiro favelas. Um, uh, beautiful. So you, you have also this gray form of resistance. Um, and you know, uh, and it is also resilience, uh, you know, in Europe, or at least in, yeah, I mean, in Europe and in the Western world. Uh, we are held yeah, with a pandemic. We have to learn how to be resilient. No? Even I mean, I'm, work, I'm working on that. You know, even the European Union has a big has a big project for the future crisis. No? How to teach Europeans how to be resilient no? because bad things will happen. Climate crisis. No? But I mean, resilience resilience as a way to face and cope changes has been the the modus vivendi of all Latin America. So it's just like, all right. Um, uh, and so we have an ongoing form of resilience of, and resilience and resistance, I think it's going together. I mean, you ex, I mean you're facing, you, you cannot change. I mean, of course, I mean, the gray zone, what I like with the gray zone is that people like are committed politically. Uh, I do think they're committed politically, but it doesn't mean that things are going to change now. No, it's not going to be a radical revolutionary process. But beside that, even with that, uh, they're still uh, struggling. Uh, that's why sometimes it's hard for a Western point of view or a European as myself to see. But they are poor. They don't do the, re the revolution. Why? No, the typical French attitude. No, no, no. no, no it's, it's much subtler. It's much subtler. It's much more. Um, in, in, in uh, I mean, I, I think even the fact of, 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 of working, of trying to live a life with dignity uh, is a way of resistance. Uh, uh, the fact of, yeah, I mean, I could, I could go on, but hopefully Kalia can give you some, some, some insight. Thank you. Yeah, and I do think there is a kind of inclusivity to this resistance, which is part of what I was getting at in my question. And I think you touch on this in um, the writing that you shared with us. So that's great. 
Yeah. One thing before Talita is going to um, ask the second question, I just wanted to say this is not a bullet. This is La Piedra del Sol um, from Mexico, from the Museo Antropológico. But, um, and, and the other thing I, I was uh, thinking is that um, everything you said about um academics also having to incorporate or like we all feel this need to um engage somehow in, in activism um i think nascimento is the best example for for that right because he wasn't only an academic he was also a politician and he was also an artist so he did he combined all these different fields of of um, i don't want to say activism but maybe consciousness you know and and I think that is also interesting because in his text he touches on this um, one point where he says the Brazilian universities once they did offer some sort of African studies or um, Afro-Brazilian studies they were still in some sort of ideology either um, prolonging um, some um, dictatorship from Lagos or um joining in this whole ideology of erasing um black culture at, or integrating by erasing black culture in in brazil so i thought um that that was also an interesting um crit critique of what is happening in academia but yes this is just a side note sorry talita you you go ahead yeah. let, 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 let me jump in just on the academia because it's, it's very interesting because people would say that uh I'm sorry, but now black people are the majority in the academia and university in Brazil as students. There's a progress. Yes and no. Yes. And no, because what kind of study they're doing? Are they engineers? Are they lawyers? Are they uh, doctors? They're not doing those kind of studies, but they will, to be straight. They're doing other kind of studies like social work, social education. So it just I mean, I quote to, I mentioned a book of Silvio Almeida, Structural Racism. I think Silvio Almeida is also in, now in, in the United States, a Brazilian scholar. He perfectly explains sometimes that very often structural racism needs to incorporate black people within the structure to, to dissolve the protest. So that's going on in Brazil. I mean, uh, in my, I mean, but still people are fighting. It doesn't mean that it's, it's stopped. I mean, to the contrary, uh, the question of diversity, I didn't mention uh, in the way of LGBTQ plus resistance uh, taking place in Brazil, it is taking place also in Brazil, but uh, I think the private sector university are getting aware of that and change uh, are also happening. Uh, so, yeah. uh, Talita, excuse me. Hey, no, I just wanted to do a side, a quick side note, because um, I'm listening to Claire's, um, Kelly, sorry, Kelly's question and thinking about your example of embodied resistances and the gray area. I thought that something that might be interesting to look into is the, um, we have more and more in Brazil on social media, you know, social media influencers. And some of them now have that resistance in the sense that they're black people or they're brown people or their bodies, they're not, you know, they're um, overweight or, you know, like they don't have the traditional cis white bodies that we're used to seeing. And I think one, a big one is Gabriela Jolivera. Her profile on Instagram is Gabidas Pretas. And she became very famous with a YouTube video talking about all the features in her face that were taught to her as something that she's a black person as not being you know, beautiful. And if you follow her on Instagram, she's just, you know, showing things that social influencers do. So she's doing like paid pu publications, she's promoting um, brands and things like that. So I think that there might be a resistance, a new type of resistance in there. Um, thinking about inclusivity too, I know that TikTok too has been a great platform for uh, people with disabilities and things like that. So I don't know if it applies directly to that, but it might be an interesting uh, new platform to look into of people that are activists, but are not super academic about it and might even have a wider reach. 
Yes, yesterday I, I do agree about social network and the influence in the in, in the population in, in Brazil to fight racism. When you mention some example of how influence uh, uh, behave in Brazil, it reminds me just to go back to Nascimento, but also one of the strategies of 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 the ideology of racism in Brazil. It works because of whiteness. I mean the the the, the um, the white is not only superior, but also you have to behave as a black individual or brown individual as if you have to be white. You know? uh, and it implies some change in the aesthetics, in the aesthetics with the hair, for instance. Um, but right now we see another kind of visual uh, commitment, affirmation of, of, of black, black subjectivities and black women in, in Brazil uh, trying to find a, a balancing point between uh, a return of to Africa, which is still very present in, in Albert Nascimento book, no? Pan-Africanism, uh, Afrofuturism, maybe for others. So this return to, to, to Africa, Black African style, and at the same time, uh, I would say a more um, urban style. Now you can see that in the in the in the in many black uh, activists, scholars nowadays in, in in Brazil, in particular in the in the social media. Yeah. I think Yuri raised his hand. Yeah, I have a question. Um, it's I really like when you in your text. Uh, when you talk about this, how within the leftist and liberal side of Brazilian politics, there is a reproduction of a certain division of labor um, that is in a way kind of racialized in which white politicians are in the, like control the public, are in the public affair side of it in the resistance. Uh, and then I was thinking when you presented on the, on the collective mandates, and I really, because it's a new development, I'm, I'm far away, I'm not totally aware. So I'm, it's also more like a curiosity too. And it seems like also the, the collective mandates, in general, you do, you do not have this uh, as participants in this mandate, this traditional political figure of the white male, right? Uh, and is, are we still kind of trapped in this pharmacon of the, of the division of labor with that in which uh, a white leftist male politician can be an individual candidate and, or I don't know, what do you think about this? I'm, I'm curious uh, what, how the collective mandates yeah, fit yeah. or explore the division of labor. Yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, uh, I mean, in, in the paper, yeah, uh, you know, so, so it might be one of the questions. Uh, once you say that, uh, survival is resistance. No? Once again, we're saying that in Brazil because because of this deep necropolitics, because of the police that want to kill people, so the fight of being alive is political resistance. But if, if we say that, maybe if we mean that, okay, so that's it. Just being alive is political. No? So the space of institutional political, excuse me, institu of institutional politics can be left for the elite, you know, if you're happy to be alive, so you're great, political resistance, that's it. So it's not what we are saying, said to the contrary, uh, survival is resistance, but there is, and there are also uh, political commitment, political engagement from the invisibles in Brazil. Uh, an example was Marielle Franco, um, black, uh, LGBTQ uh, favela activist uh, person. But there are many, many more. And it is sure that this collective mandate, so actually the collective mandate, there is only one person that is elected. No? After they, they discuss all three, all four about the mandate, but it's one person elected, and after they discuss about the project, no? permanently, we'll see. So not only, so what you say, you it's interesting because you, you add something else. It is not only, you have an intersection, you, you, you say, you have an intersection here. 
not only it's, it, it stopped the, 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 the class, the, the class uh, division, it's not only the, 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 the white Brazilian person from the upper middle class, but it's also uh, a gender division, and it's also women. So you have this intersection with uh, anti-racism and uh, agenda uh, progressive politics. You know? So uh, there is there is this once again this this visibility, you know, um, and and maybe this this kind of double intersection that you mention or you imply, you really can can be interesting to see how this uh, pro woman activism. A lot of based on rights of motherhood and uh, and black brown individuals, you see, uh, contain try to contain the, the uh, they didn't have a lot of success. They have success, but not everywhere. I don't want to to romanticize this also, uh, but try to contain the kind of white male uh, hegemony in politics in Brazil and elsewhere, of course. So I do agree. I do agree, and uh, and once again, I, I think it's very interesting for us to see that. You know, I think what I like with, with this is, uh, you know, as scholar, we are always thinking, trying to apply theory, trying to read. Uh, in my case, Foucault. Ah, look, this is Foucault. You know, it's good to 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 stop and to observe the fact, you know, silently, to, and, and 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 without judging, without trying to apply. Uh, a previous already made uh, theory. No, I think it's good, and uh, in Brazil, authors provide those these examples. And once again, there, there is a lack uh, in Brazil. This is maybe a critique, uh, and that is a critique. Uh, there is a lack of strong uh, philosophical understanding of political resistance. Definitely, there is. But it is studied in history. It is studied in sociology. Anthropology, in law, uh, but from a philosophical point of view, from a critical theory point of view, there are a lot of space to to to, to work. Thank you. Let me just quickly encourage everybody to also speak in Portuguese or French if you want. I think we would all understand. So whatever you have uh, gained from your own readings um, and what hasn't been talked about yet, you can, you can, uh, you're welcome to share your thoughts. I think everybody has read the text, so. Even yeah. if you, if you, if, even if you don't read the text, you, 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 pretend, you can pretend, it. you can pretend, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, it's just, it just is just a conversation. You don't have to think that we're here to. You can you can think about the situation in your own country, or, or or if you need to to contextualize again with 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 the United States or with the current pandemic or your own scholar academic agenda. Yeah, that's no problem. Okay, so should, I, <laughs> should, should I keep on talking? Should I keep on talking? So <laughs> I don't know. I feel like your what you just said is uh, also a really nice um, way to close this discussion. If um, no one else wants to add something, you can still do so. But I feel like what yeah about you know what you said about like observing the situation without ready-made theory and also. Um, I don't know. I feel like there's two different ways of activism right now. One is in the streets, obviously, and one that Talita mentioned, the whole activism that is happening online. And now with the pandemic, we're forced to use all these online possibilities, which in some way is great. But on the other hand, it's also what they say in the Invisible Comedy text, um, that it's important. Sorry, not comedy, committee. Um, that it's important also to be in the street and to to see what happens because I think once you observe what happens, you will see that there's that that you that human beings tend to form um, 
um, solidarity way easier than what we would what we're theoretically taught that they would you know mm -hmm. so um i mean this is at least what i've observed in the in the protests and in my very positive impression of how um how solidarity can work in anarchist structures that are that don't consider themselves anarchists i think but in all those movements etc which is also interesting when we take what you said um antonio about uh black students wanting to study all the all the social work um um fields etc you know i think that does that is a sign for how society needs to change in which direction it needs to change that it can be a way better place when we all um yeah when we all learn how to be more social i think and um the other thing that I think I will take from this discussion is not only that academics have to be um, activism activists, which we, which one is, it's one of our uh, conclusions every time we talk, but also um, that the U.S. have to uh, learn from Latin America and from Brazilians. I really liked how you coined that that term. It's like a keyword for what has to happen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what, and you know, at the same time, it is uh, because even with sometimes the, the the colonization happen in political resistance, which is terrible. I mean, it has happened. You know, we had uh, was it, was it, we had some some movements of resistance in Brazil. Just like very spontaneous, just after the the recent George Floyd uh, Black Lives Matter. So it just happened in Brazil after that with the same same movement, the same liturgy. That it is. It happened in the United States. So in Brazil, we, we, we do this this at the same time. So even here, you have a, a colonization of the thoughts and the minds, and even in the progressive, you know. So it doesn't mean that it's this. Uh, once again, I mean, all the talk today was about ongoing, massive black uh, Brazilians' uh, resistance, but that was was interesting to see that. And uh, at the same time, so this is dangerous. I, 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 it is very ironic, you know, if the, the situation of Latin America, part of it. Uh, as we know, is also from a certain uh, U.S. foreign policy, and and this and right now, if American North Americans has to learn about how to behave under a certain soft dictatorship, it's also because of this past U.S. foreign policy. So it's it's a kind of boomerang progressive effect. You know, we have we have to learn about that. But at the same time, it's cooptation also. So we have to, to be to be to be careful. Um, the, 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 you know, when I refer to Brazilians as a neologism, you know, which makes resilience, you know, resilience understood as uh, as the ability uh, to to face and to cope with uh, radical changes. And resistance as something that is more political, maybe. I think Brazilians mix the two. This is we have this in Brazil, you know, daily life. You have to cope with. I mean, you know. Uh, I mean, I, I know, I know. I mean, for many of you, I mean, I guess you. There's things that happen in Brazil that, or in Latin America, that's just a pouring rain. You can die because it's raining. Like it's raining in, in in London or in France because of this you can die in Brazil because it's raining, you know. Because of, of, uh, just tell you an example, it's raining, public transport, you're stuck in a traffic jam, you are in a public bus, someone will hijack the uh, the, the, the public bus, ask you for your money and with a gun, whatever. Or because maybe your house will disappear because it's raining. So here you learn resilience. There's no problem. Here you will learn, learn resilience. 
at the same time, um, you know, there is, a, I mentioned in, in the, that would be a bit negative here. I mentioned at the end of, the, of, the, of my paper, I'm not doing the propaganda paper, but a, a book of Elsa Dorlin, uh, Une histoire de la violence, was, uh, uh, Elsa Dorlin, uh, History of Violence. I don't think it's so translated into English yet, but she starts with something very interesting, uh, her book. It is in Portuguese, Auto Defesa, Elsa Dorna, Ubu Editora, I think. Uh, she started her book with, uh, with uh, a new technique of torturing people in the, in the French colonies, islands. I forgot exactly how it worked, but basically, basically the more the prisoner was resisting, uh, the more he was suffering. He had on the, on the, on the table in front of him a, a, a dish of food, and when he tried to reach this food, I think a, a, a sword was cutting his, 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 his skin. But the point that was this instrument of torture, of killing, was using the resistance, the body resistance of the, of the, of the, of the individual using his strength against him. And the other, Elisa Dorna, uh, of course she's doing that to contrast with the example of Foucault at the beginning of, of uh, punishing discipline, uh, another technique of punishing. Uh. So she's saying, Elisa Dorna, that it might be the way that nowadays she doesn't go much more, it's a pity in the book, she doesn't go much more, but at the beginning, it might be the way that nowadays certain form of political power are using the resistance of certain population against them. But sometimes in her book, she shows different things, you know, uh, collective uh, self-defense. You know? And that's my take. I mean, uh, maybe my paper was a bit radical because I do mention violence and do mention self-defense as a legitimate as a as a way to protect your life and and this use of of violence uh, of self-defense has been in also in, in brazil in latin america uh, it's such a scene uh, the guerrillas uh, it is part of that uh, also because of of a broader uh, massive dictatorship who torture people. I mean, the case of Brazil, and it's not, I mean, even the Brazilians don't know that, but Brazil was the longest dictatorship in, Brazil, in, in Latin America, the longest. And it, differently from many Latin American countries, even the Caribbeans, uh, like Argentina, Chile, uh, there are very few works on on the on the on the that, and there's no there's a, a, an amnesia concerning the the, 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 the the dictatorship. And even the scholars outside in Spain, progressive, would say no, in Brazil the dictatorship was a soft dictatorship, it was okay, it was not so hard as Argentina. It's it's, it's not true. It's not true. So this is also part of, of, of to understand the current situation in Brazil, but also the, the resistance, you know? the resistance. It, you know, I mean, people in Brazil were not passive. I have another form of resistance that I have explored for, for my upcoming book is uh, uh, the way that we know that the church, part of the church, engage in favor of, of the population. But also, nuns, and this is, I mean, uh, uh, nuns, women, and so it's not very famous, but uh, uh, as I'm a professor at Puki Radio, you know, there are some archive and I could have so explored that. And there are scholars that nuns has, have fought against dictatorship, hiding some weapons, for instance, in their, in their homes, uh, organizing meetings with leftist, leftist organizations. So we here also have a male, female division and female resistance is not, well, you know, 
Nuns have done nothing, just a few judgments from during the dictatorship, they have, they have also struggled a lot. Uh, also, the church, uh, part of the church has been in favor of the dictatorship, and it's complex history. But uh, yeah, I mean, the longest dictatorship, but at the same time, uh, ongoing practices of, of, of capillar form of, of resistance in the streets, in collectives, in organization, occupying buildings, like the, the Movimento, those Trabalhadores Sem Teito, just occupying buildings. Uh, they might not succeed in, maybe you can stay here one or two months, or three months, or six months. Again, you have to go out, but you want time. No? You're succeeding within time. You stay there safe in building, empty building of the Brazilian government, just occupy building. Uh, and after you go, uh, maybe uh, there is a, a strategic litigation, uh, go to the judiciary, depends on, you might lose, you might win, depends on. Um, so, this is, is uh, in front of this massive, deadly machine in Brazil, you have living bodies who are still struggling, who are still hoping for a better future, and they're doing and they're doing that. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe some more questions. Well, if there is no other question, I would say we have to stop the session. Um, thank you so much, Antonio. I'm. Yeah, let's struggle for better futures. And I hope you didn't, because at some point I thought you were maybe trying to prepare us for a civil war, but I hope that's not the last word in this discussion. And yeah, I mean, on the other hand, I'm all for occupying buildings, but hopefully in a less violent environment. <laughs> But in any case, thank you so, so, so much. And um, I really, I'm so glad that uh, finally we had um, another session on Latin America and on Brazil specifically, because I really think that we can learn so much from those perspectives. So, and also, like I said in the very beginning, this reading group was actually uh, planned with a focus on Latin America. So this was great. Thank you so much. Um, so our next session is in two weeks with um, Anna Hankings Evans, and she's going to talk about Antony Angie's Inequality, Human Rights, and the New International Economic Order, and another text um, titled Towards a Post-Colonial International Law. So um, please all come back, feel free to uh, join in to any of our sessions that are interesting to you, and I'm happy to see you every time. Thank you so much.